Uh, we are tonight, we're going to try and uh, we're going to summarize a bunch of the stuff that we've done. Um, new content wise, there's not a lot of new stuff we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to go back through some of the stuff that we've done. There is, however, going to still be uh, a component of conversation in everything that we cover. Um, so tonight is not going to be a me uh, simply uh, uh, rattling off a bunch of stuff for you. Um, I want to start tonight where we started this whole workshop. Um, we explored from the very beginning Ephesians 5. Uh, we went back to it a number of times, and, and in this passage, uh, this is the passage where Paul is assuming the role of spiritual philosopher. He creates his, his household for the early church, um, and he begins with one of the most radical statements a family advisor in those ancient times could have made, and we talked about this in week one. Submit to one, each, one another out of reverence for Christ was, was revolutionary. We talked about the patriarchal structure of the family back then, and so the idea of mutual submission, the concept of mutual submission, was not something that existed uh, in this day, and so to hear it would have been mind-boggling to the people who did. The goal of, of our workshop uh, over eight weeks, and I know we went to a bunch of different places textually, but the goal of this workshop is to create that kind of marriage. Uh, with the goal of mutual submission in mind, we did a couple of things. First of all, we tried to create an environment where mutual submission was desirable. Uh, from there, we explored the practical application, so we did the how-to stuff on how we, uh, uh, we submit to our spouse, and then we also talked about obstacles that get in the way, and then we tried to develop tools that overcome those obstacle, uh, obstacles, and then finally, we explored the idea of centering your marriage on God, and that being the thing that ties everything together. Um, tonight, it is our closing ceremonies. Uh, if you have been paying attention, you will already know how much... Uh, I've, I've pushed this acronym, but so you can see it all together, here we are, renewed. You can see the topic, uh, the, the headings on top. Let me tell you what we're going to do tonight. If you will go ahead and flip over to page two in your little handout. I have some of you who I know have been here every single night that we've done this, and I, I, am, I am flattered and shocked there were nights that I didn't know if I was going to be here or not, but I'm thrilled that you made it. Uh, there are, however, many of you who were here a bunch, maybe missed a few. Uh, school started there in the middle. You had vacations at the end of August, so, or at the beginning of August. So I know that, that the idea that all of you were here every week is probably a pretty tall order. So let me tell you what I want to do. What I want to do tonight is to briefly, and I do mean briefly, I want to summarize each of the sessions that we've done. And then I want to give you a chance with your spouse to unpack some stuff. Okay, and I'm going to use the first session as an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, you will notice in each of, these, each of these summaries is laid out the same way. I give you the basics. Okay, so if you want to read that, you can, uh, but we're going to cover a bunch of that stuff really quickly. Here are the basics from rediscovering your spouse. First of all, the happiest marriages are rooted in friendship. That's where we started this entire uh, conversation back in week one. The easiest way to rebuild your friendship with your spouse is to talk. I know that that sounds basic, and I know when you see that sentence, it almost sounds like an elementary school sentence. Uh, it shouldn't require uh, a great deal of education and licensing to say you should probably talk more. But it's not as simple as it sounds. Uh, talking, by and large, in marriages that have, that have been around for a while, uh, talking becomes just kind of a vehicle for information sharing and information gathering, uh, when in reality, talking is the vehicle for your intimacy. Uh, the goal in your talking is to learn everything you can about your spouse's world. Uh, one of the things that I've been, I've been really interested in is when, when I do, in, in individual marriage counseling sessions, when I do the Rediscover Your Spouse section and we start asking some of the questions that popped up in that week, uh, I'm, I'm always surprised at how many times we're caught off guard by how little we know about the day-to-day -day life of the person that, that is the closest to us in the world. Um, when we do this, when we spend this kind of conversation together, we create the environment where Ephesians 5 mutual submission is possible. All right, so that is the nickel and dime version of what we did in week one. Here's what I want you to do. I want you individually, now you're going to talk about it together, but individually I want you to look at that, at that number line. You will notice struggle, 10 numbers, and strength. What I would like for you to do is pretty self-explanatory, but if you're struggling, I'm going to answer it for you anyway. I want you to find where you feel you and your partner fall on this number line with this one topic. So here is the topic. The topic is how often do you talk, really talk, 
about the day-to-day -day routine uh, that is your partner's life. How often do you talk about their wants, their desires, their fears? Uh, how often do you explore and rediscover the, the reality that is your spouse? I want you to find where you think you fall on that number. You do that individually. And then I want you to discuss it and then answer the question below it. How can we improve? So if you find yourself at a nine, how can you get to a 10? If you find yourself at a one, how do we get to a five? I am not interested in you agreeing on the exact same number. Here's what I really want to encourage you to do. Pay attention to what your spouse says in this moment. Okay, pay attention to what your spouse says because if you say, well, we got an eight on this and your spouse says, uh, actually, I put a three. You know what may be going on? You may be doing a lot of talking. You may not be doing a lot of listening. Okay, so keep in mind what your spouse says here is really important. Now, for you solo flyers tonight, I know as always, I've got some people who are here without spouses. Uh, thank you as always for coming. If you're here without a spouse, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do everything that I just described with the exception of the conversation part. I want you, you, you can do it if you want. You're gonna look a little weird. Uh, but if you would, find yourself on the number line, and then how can we improve? So you can still answer those questions. All right, I'm only going to give you about a minute, and I'm going to start the timer momentarily, but I'm going to give you a second to get started on this one, and then as we get our groove, we'll move a little bit quicker. You may begin. All right. Week two. Week two, we moved from just casual conversation from from that exploratory conversation. We moved to something a little bit deeper in week two. In week two, what we moved towards was uh, the idea that expressing gratitude, but more than gratitude, expressing deep admiration, expressing fondness for your partner, expressing to your partner that, that they mean something to you, what they mean, why they mean that to you, identifying those things about your partner's character uh, that you really cling to and those things that make them your spouse, and then expressing them. Uh, a couple of points about this. Number one, the happiest marriages share a fondness for each other. Fondness is important because fondness prevents contempt. And, and I can't say this any more directly and bluntly. As a marriage counselor, when I see contempt between two individuals, uh, that is bad news. That is one of, the, it's one of the, the major issues that can arise in a marriage that can be devastating to the long-term health of that marriage. Uh, this is, again, it's gratitude, but it's, it's more than gratitude. It's telling your partner why you love them, why you value them as a person, and why they matter to you, why this person is your spouse, why you've dedicated your life to them, and why you're going to continue to dedicate your life to them. It's one thing to stand during a wedding ceremony and to tell our spouse and to commit before God that we're going to be together and I'm going to commit myself to you. But by expressing these things, you express continually that you're renewing that vow, that you're renewing that appreciation, that you absolutely adore your spouse and why. The, the couples that can do this on a regular basis tend to be much happier. And if you're struggling with this, if you don't really know where to go, I want to remind you that the best way to go into this conversation is to talk a lot about your early relationship. I rehashed this picture because it's one of my favorites ever. <laughs> Explore your early relationship with each other. All right, so here is the question that I want you to ask yourself as you answer the number line question. Here's the question. Do we do this regularly? Do we express to each other, more than thank you for taking the garbage out, do we express to each other, I appreciate the kind of man that you are? I appreciate the kind of woman that you are. I appreciate what you do for this family. Do we do that on a regular basis? One, struggle. Ten is strength. And then answer the question, how can we improve? You may begin. Once we had a handle on the casual conversation and we had a handle on the deep expressions of love and admiration, we moved on to your cell phones, and we moved on to your kids, and we moved on to all of the things that get in the way of our relationships. Uh, the, the week that we spent on distractions essentially identified that we are the most distracted culture in history. Um, we, we tend to ignore the stuff that matters most because our attention is drawn to things that for some reason are more interesting. For some reason, what's on your phone is more interesting than the person standing in front of you. But objectively, if I were to ask you which one is actually more interesting, you would say the person, but yet you're drawn to the phone. So we explored that concept the week that we did the distractions. Uh, we talked about the way to, to conquer those distractions is to one, be aware of them, and two, uh, be open and talk about them, but also to turn towards each other in boring moments. So to be proactive. When you have a moment of peace, when you have a moment of quiet, when you have a moment before the TV goes on, before the cell phone comes out, 
Instead of immediately going to the distraction, maybe spend some time going to your spouse first. Uh, as simply as I can put it, choose your family over your phone. And part of, part of this conversation was actually the, the, the five to one ratio. Um, if you've heard me in other classes, I talk about this a lot. And I talk about it a lot because it's an easy concept to wrap our brains around, but also because it is incredibly important to a healthy relationship. The five to one ratio, for those of you who weren't here, is for every one negative interaction in a relationship, if you can buffer it with five positive interactions, it is the number one indicator of relationship success. And the type of relationship doesn't really matter. It can be your kids, it can be your coworkers, it can be your husband and wife. If you weren't here, positive to negative doesn't mean uh, huge expressions of love. It doesn't mean thank you so much for everything you've ever done. It's not the stuff that we talked about in, in week two. Those positive moments can be as simple as how was your day today? And instead of just grunting, you actually turn around and look, make eye contact with your spouse and you answer the question. And then you, and then you ask a follow-up question, which I know sounds crazy, but you ask a follow-up question and then you engage in a, in a polite conversation. That's a positive interaction. For every time that your kid looks up at you and says, uh, some random comment about superheroes, which happens to me five, six, seven times a day. Uh, it's the idea that when that happens, instead of being dismissive, and instead of just saying, uh-huh, and going back to my laptop, it's turning and looking at, at my son and saying, that's really cool, thanks for telling me. And that's all it takes, but that's a positive, and, and, and that can buffer the negatives. So five to one is the best indicator of relationship success. Here's my question for you. My question is, how good are you with your distractions? Now again, I'm gonna remind you what we talked about with the first one. I'm interested in the difference between you and your spouse in terms of what you record. So don't worry about whether you agree, but talk about it if you don't. All right, you know the drill. Go ahead and begin. All right. From the distraction conversation, we moved on to the idea of enhancing the teamwork between the two of you. Uh, the idea that we're looking at here is, when we talk about teamwork, what we're talking about is the idea that everybody in the relationship has a voice. It's the idea that when decisions are made, they're made uh, mutually, and they're made through discussion. Now, I want to remind you what we talked about during that session. Um, there may be things in your relationship that you've decided are better for one of you to make decisions on and better for one of you to manage. As long as you came to that agreement uh, mutually, and it wasn't something that was kind of thrust upon the other spouse, that's great, that's working together, that's, that's teamwork. Okay, so it's not necessarily the idea that you have to have a democratic uh, process for every single decision that gets made. It's the idea that if you have an opinion that your spouse will honor that opinion, that they'll value that opinion. They may not always agree with it and they may not always roll with it, but that they'll at least, uh, uh, they'll at least hear you and that you feel confident in that. Um, it's the idea of accepting influence in your, of your partner. Uh, why this is so important is because we talked about during this session, we talked about life milestones. We talked about the fact that graduations come, kids move out of the house, uh, parents need more help than they did at one point in their lives. These things take place, and by and large, we think when we're 20, we think we're going to be well prepared for all of them. We think that when our parents get, get to a point where they're going to need our assistance, we think that we'll have that all figured out by then. We think that when the kids start school, when one of them starts school and the other one hasn't started school, we think we're going to be prepared for that. And that is hitting me in the face right now a month into kindergarten. Uh, the idea that, that, that this is all easy, it feels that way when we first get married. We don't really talk about it. We don't really think about how, how stressful it's going to be when these changes take place. Those marriages that hear each other, those marriages that really engage in conversation, get to do something that other marriages don't. They get to decide through life. They get to actually have conversation about the kind of place they want to live at certain life stages, the kind of things they want for their kids, the kind of things that they want for their parents, the kind of legacy they want to leave, the kind of mark they want to leave on church, the kind of mark they want to leave in their community. These are conversations that when you were 20 and when you first got married, you thought you weren't going to have to have because it would just be something that came naturally. When the reality is, if you're not listening to each other and you're not engaging in dialogue that allows the other person to feel heard, it's really likely that you're going to slide through life instead of decide through life. When I say slide through life, what I mean is you look up one day and you realize, this is not what I thought it was going to be. This is not what I planned. I had a whole different vision in mind. Uh, for the record, men, I had a conversation recently, and this comes up a lot with men. Uh, men, we don't ever pretend when we're kids to be the thing that most of us end up being. None of us are ever, when they're 10, no boy ever goes outside and goes, I want to play middle management. That's not fun. Nobody goes outside and says, I want to play uh, attorney. 
for corporate litigation, and I want to go through legal briefs out in the backyard. That's not what we do. Uh, we do. We do different types of things, and the reason that that's important is because conversations with you and your spouse where you can really be open and really be honest about what you're experiencing uh, give you a chance to build something a little different. I also talked about how uh, we have this idea when there's one spouse who's closed off to influence, we have this idea that it's a really like stodgy old man guy. That's not really what I see in my office. I see the super mom. And super mom is way less likely to accept the influence of her spouse than the, than the, the, the older husband that I think we traditionally think of. All right, that being said, again, you know the drill. Take a look at the uh, expand your teamwork section and we'll be done in about a minute. We are almost there. After our uh, teamwork conversation, we moved on to the fight animals. Conflict animals, not fight animals. Conflict sounds a lot easier. Conflict animals. We talked about the idea that conflict within your marriage is inevitable. It's going to happen. There is absolutely no way around it with the exception of just not talking to each other ever. Uh, if you plan on talking to your spouse at some point, you're going to have conflict at some point. Uh, we also talked about the idea that normal is a relative concept, meaning, and we really got into this in the subsequent weeks, but when it comes to fighting and conflict, um, we tend to default to whatever was comfortable for us at an earlier stage in our life, and that may not be what was comfortable for our spouse at an earlier stage in their life, and we wonder, despite that really obvious barrier between the two of us in our conflict, we wonder why the other one gets all bent out of shape. Uh, next, we talked about not fighting about the fight. And, and for this specific uh, uh, point, I, I put in parentheses, are, not should be. And the reason I say that is because it, I want to just remind you that um, when we get into a fight, don't argue about whether or not your spouse should be whatever they are. The argument is not whether you should be angry or you should be frustrated or you should be huffy with me because they are. They already are. Deal with that and move forward. Don't argue about whether or not they should be or, or, or discuss the fact that they already are. So how can you solve that problem? We also talked about the idea of starting things off right. The first three minutes of your conversation will determine how the conversation goes. Unless, of course, you are a fight hippopotamus, in which case you may just be lurking during those three minutes, waiting to snap your giant jaws. Um, if that is you, I would encourage you to look back over those notes. Uh, I also want to make sure that you hear me say again that taking breaks in conflict is acceptable. I also want to make sure that I couch that, though, with this statement. Taking breaks in conflict is acceptable as long as you go back to the conflict. Specifically, if you go back in a relatively short period of time. Here is my own two cents. As a general rule, if you're going to take a break from conflict with your spouse, I'm going to give you about an hour. Tops. If it's been more than that, uh, then, then you may be running the risk of evading the conversation. Okay, so go back to conflict as much as you can. Uh, finally, know who both of you are in conflict. And what I mean by that is, if you are married to a fight hippo, if you are married to the conflict chihuahua, which a bunch of you either are or just really like talking about it, because that's what I've heard the most of, uh, if you are married to one of those things, understand that that's okay. If you'll recall, during this week, we talked about all the good stuff that is a part of being each one of these things. If you are a conflict chihuahua, there's a whole slide that talks about why that's awesome, why that's a good, good, good thing. And yes, I'm looking right at you, Molly, because I remember the conversation I had with Jacob where he said he already called you a chihuahua, but that's different. Uh, I, am, I, am, I am really adamant that you explore the conflict style with each other so that you understand when you get engaged in conflict, there are good things about what your spouse is, there are some negative things about what your spouse may be that you can work through, but you need to know what you're working with. All right, so here's the question that I want you to be thinking about as you put yourself on the timeline. The question is this. A, do we engage in healthy combat? So it, does, our, does our conflict look fairly healthy? That may be the one to 10 thing that you're identifying here. And as a part of that, do you have at least a fair understanding of what type of conflict each of you engages in? And that kind of goes together. So that's what I want you to be thinking about as you answer the number line question, and then how can we improve? Same thing, you got about a minute, you may begin. From there, we spent two weeks on the, on the next section. We spent two weeks on this, explore your past. The reason we spent two weeks on it is because, um, it, by the way, in the two weeks that we spent, we, we could have spent, no joke, we could have spent eight weeks on this. Um, the idea that, that there's value in knowing our family of origin and knowing 
what we came out of our family of origin with is really, really, really important. Uh, in short, where we come from influences who we are. And baggage just means you've been places. Um, we don't want to run from that. I, I've, I've, I'm well aware of this. I know that therapeutically, I know that when I start talking about people's past, uh, it gets really personal really quickly. And a lot of people shut down. They don't really want to talk about their upbringing. They don't want to talk about the, the, the difficult parts of their past, the difficult parts of their childhood. Um, that's problematic because who you were really, really influences who you are. Your family of origin, and this is the best way I can think to summarize this, your family of origin can help you understand your present and it can help you shape your future. The idea that you don't want to become your father or you don't want to become your mother or that you do want to become your father or you do want to become your mother, those are good things to talk about. Those are good things to be aware of. Uh, and if, you've, if you haven't really delved into that conversation, uh, I think you're doing your marriage a disservice. So here's the question. The question to be thinking about on the number line is, A, do we understand it? Do we really know where, our, where, our, where each other came from? And then B, do we make an effort to continue to have those conversations? And I say that because I think all of us at some point in our relationship, and it was probably in the first year, we all talked about a bunch of stuff about our upbringing. But it's, it's possible that over time, we've kind of stopped talking about that. Um, it is always, to me, when we do those questions in a, in a marriage counseling session, it's always really interesting to me to see, it doesn't matter how many people I work with, at some point, people discover something that they either haven't discovered previously or they'd totally forgotten about. So the question to be thinking about as you're going through the number line is, do we do this uh, and, and, and do we have a vast uh, amount of knowledge about our spouse? So be thinking about that, answer the question, and we will move on. The last session, and we did this last week. Jason and I uh, worked together on this one. But our last session was on dedicating our marriage, and dedicating our marriage to our faith and to God, and, and creating a Christ-centered marriage. Um, we started that conversation, if you weren't here, we started that conversation in kind of a weird place. We actually started the conversation about a Christ-centered marriage by looking at secular marriage research. And the reason we did that is because I wanted to show you that when the secular world tries to explain what a real marriage looks like, what, a, what an intimate connection looks like, they, they, describe a, they describe a Christ-centered marriage. They just don't use those words. And I, and I found that really interesting, but I wanted to start in that place. And I wanted to show you as well that an immovable foundation in a marriage is a foundation that can stand up to life. Marriage is hard, and it's hard because life is hard. Things happen that we don't expect. Moments arise that knock us off our feet. And in those marriages that make it through and in those marriages that, that serve as a support system to each other, by and large, it's because the foundation of that marriage is not your relationship. And it's not just the way you look at each other. And it's not just how much you liked each other when you were dating. The foundation of that marriage is your shared faith and your shared quest for spirituality and your shared quest to be a, a more God-like marriage, a more Christ-like marriage. Uh, we also talked about some very practical applications of this. Pray together, study together, worship together, minister to other people together, grow together. Uh, we gave you an opportunity last week to pray specifically with your spouse. Uh, these are the, the basic fundamental elements of a Christ-centered marriage. I understand that we got really personal. Uh, when we start talking about, and I start asking you to discuss with your partner in an open setting like this, to discuss where you fall, on, on a timeline and to, we took a quiz, like to do all that in an open setting like this, I know it was a little bit uncomfortable, uh, but I can't do a marriage workshop and not talk about this and I can't, I can't present this material without it sounding really personal because it is. So here's what I want you to be thinking about as you, you look at your number line. The question is, are we building a Christ-centered marriage? Are we building a Christ-centered marriage? Now I'm asking that question as a continuum and the reason I'm asking you that is because I don't know that, I don't know that we ever get there I don't know that there's a finish line where we look at each other and go, okay, yes, this is faithful enough. I don't think that happens. I think it's a constant battle. It's a constant, uh, uh, it's a constant race. So the question that I want you to be thinking about is, are we building, are we currently building a Christ-centered marriage? Answer your question on your number line, and then ask yourselves, how can we improve? You got about a minute. All right, we've just got a few minutes left, and I want to be sure that we've done everything. Um, you'll see again the acronym, and you'll see kind of the... Uh, the, um, uh, the, the process that we went through over the course of the last eight weeks. 
I want to flip to commitments and prayers, and it's on that back page. Uh, I want you to take a look at everything we've done in the last eight weeks. Uh, you just went through every session to decide whether or not it was an area of struggle or an area of strength for you. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Now, I put three numbers down there just because that was the easiest thing for me to do, but whether it's one, whether it's 20, I'd like to finish this with action. I'd like to finish this, this nine-week exploration with action, and here's the action I'd like to be thinking about. What are you willing to commit to your marriage tonight to do differently based on some of the conversations you've had with your spouse? What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to, to put yourself out to do uh, in order to grow your marriage and in order for your marriage to be more like the marriage that I think God intended for it to be? I also want you to look where it says prayers, prayers for our marriage. You remember last week I gave you an entire list of, of possible options to pray for. Um, I'd like for you if, you, if you're comfortable with it, to jot a few down tonight. If not, I want you to be discussing it, and I want you to be praying actively for your marriage. Be praying actively for things that your marriage needs for your spouse specifically. So what I want you to do is take two minutes, and then we need to wrap it up with commitments and prayers for our marriage. This is a conversation between the two of you, but your commitments are your commitments. This is not just a what do we commit. This is what do you commit to your spouse. You got about two minutes, and then we'll finish up. If, uh, if you'll allow me, I want to end this. I want to end this in a weird place. Um, stay with me. Do me a favor. If you can, stand up where you are. All right, here's what I want to do. We've just got a few minutes left. If you have been married for five years or less, I want you to have a seat. If you have been married for 15 years or less, have a seat. If you have been married for 25 years or less, have a seat. If you have been married for 30 years or less, have a seat. If you've been married 40 years or less, have a seat. Can we just go ahead and, and, and applaud now for this? You may have a seat as well. Let me tell you why I wanted, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that for a number of reasons. One, because I don't know if it's a coincidence that, that we have couples who've been married that length of time who are at a marriage workshop. I think, I think there may be a reason that those marriages are some of the happiest marriages that I personally know. I also want you to know this. Uh, yeah, we do this kind of thing, but there's a lot of marriage support in this building, and it's not all the professional licensed support. A lot of it is uh, that group of people who was standing at the end. Uh, I want to encourage you to, A, if you are, if you are in need of mentorship, if you are in need of, of uh, conversation with somebody who's been there, I want you to seek out some of the people who were just standing. And if you are one of the people who was just standing, I want you to make a commitment to being available for those marriages, to be willing to offer insight into how you do it and how you have done it and how you have not killed each other. All right, a couple other things I want to mention before we're done. First of all, I want to talk for a second about family life ministry, and the reason I want to do this is because I want you to know something. Um, over the course of this little series, it's become evident to me that while we've done a pretty decent job of letting people know what I'm doing here, uh, I want to be clear about something. If you struggled with anything we did over these nine weeks, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. This is what I do for a living, and 95% of my work at Eastridge is behind closed doors doing counseling. Please come and see me. And please do not wait until it's been three years, four years, five years, and that distance has grown. If you've struggled with any of this stuff and you just need a tune-up or you need a conversation, please come and see me. Um, I, I've been asked this as well. Uh, so what's the fee for counseling services? That's the point. It's free for you. You just come and see me. We'll sit down and talk as long as you need. We'll do as many sessions as we need to do, and we will do it in a structured marriage and family therapy format. There is my email address. Use it. So I, I say that because I think we've done, again, a decent job of talking about what I'm doing here, but I want to make sure that, that we say it out loud. Also, every session we have done, all nine weeks, including tonight, is available. Here's what I want you to do. The audio is all online. You can get there through our Facebook page, or you can get there through our website. The, the handouts, just email me. Tell me what you need. I will be more than happy to send you all the PDFs that I can to make sure that you've got it. I got an email earlier this week, and I promise you it actually said, I need the one from last week because I'm working on a complete set, which made my day.
All right, I want to finish with, I told you we were going to give you a token of my appreciation. Um, on your way out, I got something for you. So there's two things that, that uh, I want you to notice about this. Number one, I take great pride in the fact that it's not one of those little tiny T things. It's a big one because I want you to use it. The little small ones are cheap, but they're cheap because no one uses them. So uh, on, on one side, you have the East Ridge logo. You'll have the beautiful East Ridge logo. On the other side, it says this. And here's why we did mugs. And here's why we did these mugs. We did these mugs because I want to remind you, if we could kind of encapsulate everything we've done the last nine weeks, talk to your spouse. I want you to have a cup of coffee one day, and I want you to pick this up, and you'll notice the renewed part is facing you if you're right-handed. And if you're left-handed, then you're wrong. So that's just switch. <laughs> so if you are drinking your cup of coffee, right-handed, and you go to drink it, I want you to see those words, and I want you to think to yourself, maybe instead of watching TV during this cup, maybe I'll talk to her. Maybe I'll talk to him. Maybe now's a good time to pull out those questions from the first week. Maybe now's the time to pull out those compliments from the second week. Maybe now's the time to pull out those questions from the Explore Your Past uh, section. I, I want this to serve not just as a token of our gratitude, but as a reminder every time you have a cup of coffee. I don't, it, not me, I want you to think about. It's your spouse I want you to think about. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 14, I'm sure most of you are familiar, uh, do everything in love. I think that kind of encapsulates marriage, doesn't it? Fight. It's okay, fight, but fight in love. Uh, all the other aspects of your life, raise kids in love, uh, discipline your kids in love, uh, correct your spouse in love. All of these things can be done in love. My closing thought for you is this. There is no finish line to this race. We are, we are running a race that we're not going to cross a finish line at and be able to look at each other and say, man, that was great. Good job. We're not going to get there. The goal is to continue to grow. I gave you, and I want to make sure you hear me say this because I have some people who I'm sure were trying to get through it as my honor students. I gave you about eight months worth of conversations. So those pieces of paper, I know there was a lot there. And some of you walked out frustrated that I didn't give you enough time to go into it. That was kind of the plan. I wanted you to have a long time to go through this. And no joke, I gave you probably eight or nine months worth of conversations. If you need them again, please let me know. I'm going to finish tonight while I slip over to the table. On your way out, if you would swing by that table, I'm going to give you a mug and say thank you for coming. Um, but while I slip to that, I'm going to ask Quinn to finish us out in prayer. And if you would, Quinn, um, specifically for any marriage that may be struggling and who might need that prayer.